So we'll get started right away um, with, uh, with my presentation. I wanted to spend just a little bit of time here giving uh, uh, an introduction to the practice of, of tile drainage and uh, to kind of get everyone on the same uh, level playing field. So why drain? Uh, in, in many parts of the United States and worldwide, uh, particularly in the upper Midwest uh, of the U.S., uh, we have poorly drained soils. And uh, these poorly drained waterlogged soils tend to be an impediment for crop production. So the purpose of the drainage then uh, in agriculture is to remove some of the excess water from the, the plant root zone uh, for those growing plants. Now waterlogged soils uh, can have a number of detrimental uh, impacts uh, when we look at their effects on plant production. Uh, and one of them is uh, slow gas exchange at the soil surface, particularly oxygen. Uh, when the soil profile might be deficient in oxygen, oxygen it creates problems for the plant roots uh, to be able to take up water and nutrients. We also know that a very important process, nitrification, can be inhibited uh, and even prevented when we have waterlogged soils. Plant diseases, many fungal diseases, uh, become more prevalent when we have waterlogged or very wet soil conditions for prolonged periods of time. We can also have situations where, particularly early in the season, if plants are stressed by very wet or waterlogged conditions, that it can stunt the growth of the crop roots. Uh, and then if we have a situation where later in the growing season it becomes dry, uh, that we could have stunted the growth of those roots, and uh, this could be uh, uh, adding some drought stress perhaps later in the growing season. Of course, we know that uh, wet soils uh, tend to be more prone to compaction when we have to uh, be in the field doing field operations, uh, and so that can be a detriment. We also know that these soils take much longer to warm up. Plant germination can be delayed, and in some cases, uh, particularly in the western part, uh, uh, of the country in the western part of the Corn Belt that uh, poor drainage, uh, waterlogged soils can result in the accumulation of soils near the soil surface. Now, some of the benefits that we can derive from drainage, uh, when we look here, this is an actual diagram, it's a histogram of some real yielded data uh, from uh, a particular field in, in southwestern Minnesota where we were looking at corn. Uh, we worked on this field over time. This is about a 100-acre field. We looked at a period of no drainage, uh, and we were averaging our, our average yield was somewhere around 150 bushels. And you can see there's a long tail uh, on, and really on both sides of this where we had some very low yields, we had some higher yields. After the implementation of conventional drainage, um, we shifted that whole histogram, so we shifted the yield uh, over to the right, which indicates that uh, we improved yield in that field overall by adding the drainage. And, and here you can see our average yield moved up from about 150 to 175 bushels. So that's a real result of, of the, the benefit of having drainage out there. Now we know that uh, drainage can also reduce soil erosion. Uh, it can make our seedbed um, uh, and planting dates better and earlier in the season. Um, we can have better plant growth yield and health out there, and as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, we can look at reduced salinity uh, under irrigated conditions and, and drier conditions. Drainage is not certainly not all a panacea, and of course many people, uh, if you're listening to the news and watching the reports in the newspapers, that uh, you know there are some drawbacks of drainage, mainly nutrient losses from drainage systems, nitrogen, phosphorus. We also can see some some sediments, some pesticides, those types of things. Uh, and this can affect not only uh, local uh, water bodies, but also uh, particularly those of us that are part of the Mississippi River Basin can affect uh, water quality in the Gulf of Mexico. So we have benefits of drainage, but we also have to be cognizant of some of those drawbacks and how we can try to manage for agronomic uh, and environmental goals. Now, this diagram is a, a diagram of the United States, and in this central area, the, the uh, upper Midwest uh, shows uh, where the uh, density of tile drainage is the greatest. This comes from the last agricultural census 
uh, from 1992. So everything in red uh, is the highest intensity of, of agricultural drainage. So it's, it's highly focused and centralized in, in that portion of the country. It also happens to be no coincidence that when we look at uh, the same map, uh, but uh, looking at plant available water, that uh, the plant available water uh, is also highest uh, in that same region of the country. When we start thinking about uh, actually implementing field drainage uh, with uh, subsurface tile drainage, we really have three types that, uh, that we think about primarily. One is surface drainage, uh, one is subsurface drainage, and the last one is managed drainage, also known as control drainage. And I won't spend much time talking about the third one because Dr. Brown will be speaking about that uh, quite a bit today. But the idea is, is that when we're draining with particularly subsurface drainage, we're really removing gravitational water. That's the water of interest. So it's the water that's uh, least uh, held tightly in the soil profile. And when we use drainage systems, uh, either surface or subsurface, uh, or controlled managed drainage, to get that water out of the field, uh, it's the gravitational water uh, that we're trying to affect. And the amount of gravitational water, uh, as you can kind of see on this diagram, changes when we change soil texture. So these at the left tend to be the sandier, coarser, uh, lighter soils, whereas these on the right tend to be the heavier, uh, heavier soils. Just a couple of slides here about surface drainage. Uh, it's not practiced everywhere, but surface drainage is really uh, removal of water that would necessarily collect on the surface of the land. Um, this is usually done with shallow infield ditches and oftentimes land leveling or land forming uh, so that we crown those fields uh, and allow the water to uh, run off into those shallow field ditches and, and then out of the field itself. Subsurface drainage, on the other hand, uh, uh, you know, we really can't see very well after it's installed, but the upper figure here shows a diagram of a field uh, in southwestern Minnesota. Um, all of these uh, lines that you can see that are parallel to one another across the field uh, are areas where subsurface tile drainage was installed in that particular field. This field happens to have a 50-foot drain spacing. This area of the field, uh, was, it was not necessary to drain, so the farmer chose not to drain it. And there you see that there are no pipe in the ground. This is a, a little diagram of the area where drainage would be underground. So we have these pipes that are spaced apart, and uh, we have the water then draining, the, the gravitational water draining to those sites uh, to improve the field conditions. Again, Surface, subsurface drainage only removes that the gravitational water. We remove that water uh, using what we call a drainage coefficient, and that's expressed in a depth per, per day. So we may think of a drainage coefficient as three-eighths of an inch of water uh, in a day that we would like to remove in the gravitational water. Um, these systems are primarily designed uh, and consideration taken for crops, soil types, locations, topography. Um, and as, as Dr. Brown will uh, allude to in his presentation, we can manage the water in some cases up or down uh, in, these, in these fields. And of course, uh, the drainage, the subsurface drainage and surface drainage can uh, affect the uh, hydro hydrologic response of those fields. Now, <clears throat> there are several different considerations when thinking about installing these drainage systems. Uh, I've highlighted three of them right here, again, the drainage coefficient, usually in some kind of uh, depth per day, three-eighths of an inch to half an inch is fairly common. We also think about drain depth and drain spacing, so how deep and how wide apart are those, those drain pipes, and then the diameters and the gradients. Uh, this figure down and below is a, is a slide rule tool. There's also a number of institutions, the University of Minnesota, Iowa State, and others that have uh, electronic or digital tools that people can use to help uh, make determinations for their, uh, their drainage systems. We also encourage you to visit with contractors um, who can help uh, with uh, the installation of those drainage systems appropriately. The last slide here uh, of this introduction is, is to really kind of give people an idea of uh, you know, how are these things designed out in the field? There are, are a number of systems. Uh, the first three here that we're looking at, the, the top two and the bottom, 
uh, a really uh, geometrically uh, um, rectangular or a herringbone in this case where we tend to be draining large parts of a field or whole fields. Um, the random pattern of drainage down here at the bottom reflects the drainage of depressions or low areas uh, where someone might want to uh, just specifically drain a spot uh, instead of a whole entire field. So I hope that that, uh, that uh, introduction uh, is going to be helpful. There are a number of resources that you'll be able to look back to later uh, from some of the different institutions uh, where you can find more information and, and that will certainly hopefully be helpful for everyone.